What is up? Oh, man. Good evening and welcome to Build, everybody. I'm your host, Matt Forte. We are here live at the Build studio in New York City. We've got one more for you today, and it's going to be fantastic. We've assembled an outstanding array of individuals for a panel discussion on climate change and science. We have an infinite amount of things to get to in a very finite amount of time, so let me tell you about our guest. Dr. Kate Marvel is here, and as far as I'm concerned, as a climate scientist and associate research scientist at the NASA Goddard Institute for Space Studies and for Columbia University, she is every bit a superhero as her name implies. John Idarola is here as well. He's a host and producer for the online news and politics show, The Young Turks. He can also be seen as host of True North, the new docu-series which follows John through the Arctic to show the impacts of climate change on the region. That's premiering April 19th on Verizon's Go 90. And lastly, certainly not least, a science educator, mechanical engineer, New York Times best-selling author and host of the Emmy-nominated Bill Nye Saves the World on Netflix. His latest behind-the-scenes documentary, Bill Nye, Science Guy, premieres tonight, April 18th on PBS. It follows him as he takes off his Science Guy lab coat, but not the bow tie, never the bow tie, and takes on those who deny climate change, evolution, and a science-based view. Uh, guys, that's right. The great Bill Nye is here as well. How about that, huh? How about that panel? That's a panel. <laughs> it's gonna be awesome. We're gonna bring everyone out and kick this thing off in just a second. But before we do, we have a trailer for Bill Nye Science Guy. So Luke, let's go ahead and run that clip. Please join me in welcoming America's favorite scientist, Bill Nye the Science Guy. Greetings! Just the start of things, we're getting things wrapped up. It was really the 1990s. I wanted to make young people excited about science again. Science! I studied at Cornell University. I decided to take astronomy from this famous professor, Carl Sagan. He said kids resonate to science, and I really embraced that. A lot of people of my generation attribute their interest and love of science to Bill Nye. You would just see the TV cart come in, and then just hear, Bill, Bill, <laughs> Bill. <laughs> the Science Guy show contained the science that excited Bill. And you, the viewer, can't help but be just as excited as the instructor. I was asked to talk about selfie fatigue. Oh, here we go. Yeah. Ah, go, go, whoa! I'm pretty sure it shortens your life. <sighs> Science Guy show is over. I gotta move on to something bigger. Nowadays, I'm talking to adults, and I'm not mincing words. Climate is changing. It's our fault. We gotta get to work on this. This is where we see the smoking gun. This is raising sea level. This is drowning Miami eventually. Bill successfully transitioned from Bill Nye, the science guy, for kids, to the science statesman. We have the We're going to space! Rocket science. That's the bottle I'm drinking with Bill. Mission control. Go ahead, Bill Nye. I would just like to say the following thing. Woohoo! We are, dare I say it, changing the world! Yeah! Joe Bastardi challenged me to a debate. You agree with Bill, that? you don't want to go here. Currently, Joe Bastardi is a climate denier. If Joe changed his mind, that could be very influential. I'm not trying to save the world. Bill Nye himself is not a scientist. I don't have a PhD. I talk to the experts and hold the evidence in my hands. These people who are denying science, and especially denying climate change. We just can't have this. If we raise a generation of kids, they can't think critically we are headed for trouble. My dad's big thing was to leave the world better than you found it. My drive to do all this is from my parents. I try to be worthy of them. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please make some noise and welcome your panel, John Idarola, Dr. Kate Marvel, and Mr. Bill Nye. Come on, come on. Uh, everybody, thank you so, so much for being here with us tonight and hanging out with us on Build. Uh, it is a thrill to have all of you here. Uh, Bill, congratulations on this film. Uh, John, congratulations on your series. And, and okay, I just, I was looking at your, uh, no, your TED Talk, over a million views, it's pretty amazing. Congratulations, everybody. You all, yeah. You guys are all. That was a wonderful round of applause. Congratulations, audience. That was, that was pretty good. Yeah, everybody. I'm just gonna say right now, everybody in this room is crushing it, guys. This is a, this is a great room to be in. Uh, we're gonna open it up and we're gonna do a lot of things, a lot of open discussion points, but I do, just because we just saw that trailer, I, I just quickly and briefly wanna start, Bill, with a, a question or two about this project in particular. You, you've been out there fighting this fight for a while. 
uh, and and I, I'm curious why uh, now. What was the impetus behind telling this story now? Okay, peoples. I signed a contract. I had no creative Everything. control over this film. I'm not joking you. Wow. So these documentary film producers followed me around for a couple of years. There were people who grew up watching the old show, the Science Guy show, and were wondering what what's his name was up to now. And they followed me around. And uh, I, there's a part in the middle that I find very unsettling. Yes, well, you, if you're going to let go, you got to let go. But then, you know, ultimately, it's okay. So uh, watch it and, you know, turn it up really loud. Especially midway, apparently. That's uh, Well, that's the quiet part. That's so the quiet part. you want okay. to turn it up loud there. Was that, uh, so you signed this contract, they show up, they're following you around for months. Was that something that was in the back of your mind, that something that you would find unsettling would end up in it? Oh, you yeah, struggle yeah. With that? So here's the story I tell. Do you guys know James Randi is? The Amazing yeah. Randi? Uh -huh. The Amazing Randi. Yeah, so he offers you a million dollars to produce a paranormal effect yeah. and if you, uh, that he cannot reproduce. No one's ever won in what's it been 28 years no one's ever won and so uh i saw the film about him Great film. and there's a part in the middle where he's in tears saying you better not put this in the movie and that of course is the most compelling part of the whole thing <laughs> so i realized <laughs> that's right well but it's what you want to watch so i realized in order for the thing to be accessible you gotta gotta let go man you gotta let go and you gotta you gotta, do you gotta it. trust it <laughs> You know, there's there's something to be said uh, for for the the power uh, of storytelling and, and and what it can do, especially to engage uh, people, young people in general. Yeah, and I think that's something you figured out really early on, Bill. And correct me if I'm wrong, but is that understanding that power and how that can move people? Is that sort of where the science guy, Bill Nye, the science guy, came from? Well, the Was science it? guy came from uh, a couple things. I, as an uh, engineer, excuse me, as an engineer who came of age. Uh, after the space program was tapering off, yeah. replacing the space shuttle for something else. Um, and we had the Ford Pinto and the Chevy Vega and leisure suits. And uh, we're not gonna have metric, we're not gonna teach the metric system in US schools anymore. I was very concerned about the future of the US. Yeah. That's one thing. And then the other thing, when you're in love, you wanna tell the world. <laughs> and I love science, so uh, that's why I, I tried to get, we had very compelling research in the 1990s that 10 years old is about as old as you can be to get the so-called lifelong passion for science. And so uh, that's why w I, we did the show for people who are 10 years old or so. That's fascinating. How do, how do you go about, how do you find that metric? How do you know that's the sweet spot? How do you know uh, well, I, there are people who study this, do yeah, so-called longitudinal studies, get hold of students when they're uh, pre-kindergarten and follow them into their professional careers. That's it. Yeah, it's mostly there was a guy at the University of Michigan that was really into this. But um, yeah. anyway, if it's not 10 years old, it's 11. Right. When did you want to be a storyteller? When did you want to be a scientist, Kate? Heavens. Yeah. Oh. Um. I, I'm actually, I'm a latecomer because I wanted to be an actress um, until I was about 20. Um, and then I took a class on astrophysics in college and I was like, why did nobody tell me about this? <laughs> cool. It's amazing. But the reason your TED Talks had a million views is because you're a performer. Yes? Um, I am a scientist. <laughs> can you be both? <laughs> you, you can be whatever you want to be. You happen to be both. I, I'll I second so. it because he's right. You watch that talk, and uh, and you do have a lot of great laugh breaks and a lot of great moments within this, you know, data heavy science to talk about clouds. But you're you're working the room, like you know what you're doing. You have that ability. You know, I try. <laughs> <laughs> she got a laugh right there. There you go, crushing it. Cool. While we're going down this line of logic, uh, John, do you know when when you wanted to be a storyteller? When you wanted to do what you do? Uh, I only knew for a long time that I liked talking about politics and the news. Like I very early on, I, I went to college two weeks into my freshman year was 9-11. I had never thought about politics before and suddenly it became this important thing. And uh, I started looking around for sources of media, like places I could trust. And I found some who they themselves were great storytellers. And uh, I never intended to join the media. I still don't really consider myself a part of it. I just, I want to know what's going on. And if I can help people do that, that's, that's my job, I guess. 
Very cool. Well, we, we talked, uh, I mentioned briefly the idea that storytelling, we talk about young people being motivated to be engaged in things of this nature. There was something really interesting that I read that I'd love to, to, to open up and get some thoughts on. I just saw recently kids in Florida were suing their governor for a lack uh, uh, of, of responsible action in response to climate change. I thought that was amazing. And then in Colorado, I saw today they're suing Exxon and Suncor as well. This, this thing of, of, of litigation, of suing... Is this an effective method, in your opinion? What does this do? What does this mean for us? I don't feel like I've seen this Got before. you talking about it. Yeah, well, there we go. Okay, right? so I say all the time, and Dr. Marble, see if, this, if you agree with this at some level. People say to me, Bill, Nye, science guy, <laughs> what, can, what can I do about climate change? What can I, and I say all the time, if we were talking about it. Yeah. If we were talking about climate change we were talk, the way we're talking about gun violence, we'd be doing something about it. If we were talking about climate change the way we're talking about whoever is representing whom in lawsuits with respect to the President of the United States and his colleagues, we would be doing something about it. So if we were all talking about climate change, we'd be on it. So these students are getting us talking about it. Governor Scott, for those of you unfamiliar from Florida, is the guy that has forbidden anyone to use the phrase climate change in press briefings. Uh, let alone do anything about it. And, of course, the irony for us who have thought about it, Florida's getting it two ways. Yeah. The water's coming over the shore, and it's coming up through the limestone. It's <laughs> people. <laughs> and so if you, is anybody from Florida, especially South Florida, are you from South Florida? Have you had trouble with your in car insurance where the wheels of your car get rusty from the salt water coming in? Yeah, it is something that she has to think about. Yeah, yeah. so anyway, uh, so it, talk it, about climate change, peoples. So ultimately, even let's say the, the lawsuit itself doesn't actually go anywhere. He's not forced to take any action, but it's already done what its intended purpose was, which is to raise uh, the topic, get the conversation well, started. I th I'm not carrying out the lawsuit, but I think that's <laughs> the first Why thing not? they hope. The second thing they hope is that it does do something, yeah. that the yeah. governor does have to do something about it. Yeah. And uh, we also, I mean, there's there's larger scale uh, lawsuits that are attempting to go forward towards the federal government for not doing anything about climate change. Yeah. And I think that's that's great, whether they actually succeed or not, because it gets us to rethink cause and effect and the, the cost of how we generate uh, energy. Like, we're really good at knowing if something's in our face as humans, our brain can interpret that as a threat. We're really bad at long-term stuff. Yeah. And so, like, like, if there was a serial killer outside your door, you'd do something. But if pollution kills 3.7 million people a year worldwide, it's a big problem. What are you going to do? It's not you. What? Exactly. And carbon, we may not be able to say that this one person got sick or that person died because of this particular set of emissions, but we know that the link is there. And if people start to think about that as a result of these lawsuits, then I think it's a great idea. Is that sort of too, is that what led you, John, to the location for your series for True North that you went out to the Arctic? Because it's where we can uh, very easily observe some of the ramifications, but it's so far away, nobody thinks about it or cares. I mean, it's, it's a part of the world yeah. that every time you look at a map, you've seen Svalbard, but how many people could point to it on a map? Right. I couldn't before. But the main reason we went there is because I wanted to take a topic like climate change, which can be a little bit abstract and a little bit global and a little bit long term. And I want. Can I ask you, what is a little bit global? <laughs> <laughs> seems like a lot. It's global ish, I guess. Uh, yeah, it's, it's a big problem in time and space and all of that. And you think about the climate scientists, and you know some of them are, are lovely people who do TED Talks, and thankfully a lot of people pay attention. But very often, I think a lot of people just think of them as they're academics. And so I wanted to embed myself in a team of these international scientists and show what their life is like, that these people are not just, you know, they're not just producing papers. They're risking their life yeah. to shed light on what's going on around our, our world. For sure. And Bill, I think you went to, you went to Greenland as part yes, of this. Yes, well. yeah, yes. Yeah. Uh, and it's in the film quite a bit. Yeah, I, I want to talk about both of your trips there and explain it. But before we go any further into this, I do believe we have the trailer for True North. I want to see if we can throw that up real quick, give everybody some context, see a little bit about the show, and then we'll come back. The Young Turks. We're going to be counter-establishment. We're going to tell people the truth. Yeah! We're going to rock the boat. Hey! We're sending two of our reporters, John and Shavala, to the North Pole. We're en route to an abandoned ghost town. 
We're gonna be learning how to dog sled. <laughs> this is amazing. We're gonna be hiking on glaciers. Oh, that drops off. We're gonna be going on boats. 13 days out on the open ocean, conducting scientific research. The uh, glacier is retreating faster than this map is updated. We're gonna be seeing all of this new wildlife exposed to native cultures. We're gonna be hiking, camping, seeing the Aurora Borealis. You don't want to be the one responsible for a polar bear walking right into a camp. I'm theorizing that we're not going to die imminently. This is humanity at its most tenacious. That looks amazing. Yeah, we can absolutely. I'll I'll hold for that. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Sir. I have a question. Why are you guys wearing helmets here? You on a glacier? Uh, that that is taken on a glacier. Yes. Okay. So in case there's ice. Uh, you fall in a crevasse or what have you. Or fall in a crevasse, yeah. I mean, you think about a glacier, you think it's a, it's a bunch of snow and it's a bunch of ice, but it is more complex than any other landscape I've ever been on. And it drops off in a way that, with the limited amount of training that I had, I didn't want to experience firsthand. Yeah. By first, you mean catastrophic interaction with gravity. Exactly, yes. <laughs> yes. So, uh, You'll it, get it. So, it's a little bit gravity-ish. Yeah, so uh, the thing about... Glaciers, this is really cool. This guy from um, University of Copenhagen mm -hmm. says, you're standing on a mineral near its melting point. Hmm. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, hold the mic. Oh, that's, a, <laughs> that, that's a great way to put it. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Marvel, I wonder if you could uh, uh, elaborate a little bit on why this particular location brought both of these gentlemen there for that. Why is it so important that we observe uh, the Arctic in, in this area? Um, I mean, I think it's really important to note that the Arctic is the front line of climate change. It's melting, it's warming faster than any other region on the planet. Um, but I think a lot of times we can say, well, it's the Arctic, we don't live there. You know, I'm gonna be kind of sad when the polar bears are gone, but like, I don't know any polar bears, you know? Um, <laughs> and, um, and I think it's important to kind of note that everything is connected. What happens in the Arctic doesn't stay in the Arctic. And that's something that in my work as kind of a more global climate scientist, I don't just look at the Arctic, I look at global climate changes. And things that happen in the Arctic, that melting has global consequences. Well, let me ask you about, may I ask about the Gulf Stream? Uh -huh. So ice is falling off of Greenland, sliding off of Greenland. It's fresh water. Right. And it gets mixed in with the northern, uh, with the 12 o'clock position of the Gulf Stream, right? Right. So a paper just came out saying that we're seeing things slowing down in that big ocean conveyor belt. And I think there's still, uh, you know, scientists are always going to say, well, there's still a lot of work to be done. There's still a lot of science to be done looking at, you know, the exact links between that and climate change and what to expect in the future. But I think it's really important to note that this is, we are doing an experiment that we've never done before. Right. And on like a planet. We, on a planet where we live, you know, it's not just like some random other planet. You said it's like <laughs> doping. Right? It's, yeah, it's totally like we are doping the planet and we don't even know what that means. We don't know what the consequences are going to be. Can I ask you a question? What, what are some of the things that we are the most certain about? Because I think especially on the denier side, they love to, to highlight the, the, the not so clear connections between human behavior and blah, blah, blah. But it's like, but there are some things that we're fairly certain. Oh, totally. Yeah. So we are 100% sure carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas. We are 100% sure that we are emitting it. Um, we are 100% sure that carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is going to warm up the planet. We are extremely, extremely, extremely sure that the warming that we've observed so far is due to human activities. Um, the uncertainties come in when you look at smaller scales, when you look at what's going to happen in New York City in the year 2020. I can't give you an exact answer for that. But the Yankees are going to be, it's going to be huge. <laughs> right. <laughs> totally. But like for me, like as a scientist, that uncertainty isn't comforting. You know, that's not like, oh, well, it's probably going to be fine. Like we're pretty sure it's not going to be fine, but we don't know how not fine it's going to be and when that not fine is going to happen. I, I want to say just one thing. Very often from deniers, especially powerful public figure deniers, some of whom might live at the White House, they, they pitch scientists as these diabolical forces who are engaged in some sort of massive, a little bit globalish conspiracy where they're I making wish. up things. No, I totally wish. That would um, be fun. And they're making it up to make money because you know all these climate scientists are they've got they've got a lot of money. Oh man, I have um, those, some of those guys drive Honda Accords. <laughs> yes, exactly. 
and it makes me sick. Um, but, but my experience, both in listening to Dr. Marvel right now and in the scientists that I did the show with, is they are the most humble people. Yeah. I've, like, I'm, I live in LA. I've never experienced humility like that. <laughs> they refuse, they're too humble. Honestly, I would say, but they refuse to say this is definitely going to happen or this needs to be done. They talk specifically about what they know. This idea that there's some sort of diabolical force could not be more de more detached from reality. And plus that they would get along. Due respect. <laughs> Don't you guys try to just under uh, uh, prove the other person wrong? And, oh my gosh, yeah. Like if you've ever tried to get a paper published in a scientific journal, like it makes you feel so terrible about yourself. You're like, why do all three reviewers hate me? Um, <laughs> and even, you know, if you've even been in a room with scientists and you're trying to like order pizza, like people are going to argue about the pizza toppings, right? So yeah. in order to get scientists to agree on something, it has to be so obvious and so real and there has to be so much evidence. Yeah. So it's just the problem has been the contrarians or deniers have managed in the mind of most of many people to equate the idea that plus or minus 2% is the same as plus or minus 100%. Uh, doubt about this much of it is the same as doubt about a whole thing. And it's a fossil fuel industry that's really, pun intended, fueled this uh, wacky view. But my claim, speaking of Florida, is that when these people who are filing this lawsuit as students and the people who got shot at at their high school who become activists, when people of that generation come of age, things are gonna turn around in a weekend. Well, to that end, there, there is something uh, that, this is what scares me, that, that, that I see out there is the obvious unavoidable situation with climate change, but also, and I don't wanna label it as a, as a movement, but there's a lot of, uh, almost an anti-science thing going on. Well, the world's flat, flat, man, I exactly. heard that. Exactly, flat earth is And if you, eat, if you eat like cherries and milk at the same time, it's like poison. <laughs> I heard that. Like, it's just so weird. Do you understand? What clothes are you wearing? Nobody is wearing clothes that are made in North America. We have changed. The world has changed. We make tires, car tires in France. We make clothes in Asia. And everything's cool. We make software in the U.S. All right, so uh, the reason we're able to have this global commerce is because we understood how to navigate the trackless ocean. We are using the same seaports today that we used in the 1600s. Peoples. The world is not flat. It's not flat. Dude. <laughs> now, Dude. Have you, so you obviously you've Can I borrow your car? Thing. No, you can't borrow my car. If you can't figure out that the world is a ball, no. <laughs> it's not happening. No. It's out of the question. Absolutely. Have you observed anything similar Outside of the U.S., uh, is this something that's unique to our area that perhaps our government I is compounding or encouraging in a way? Or is this something that is just a, a sort of taken off a phenomenon of sorts because of... No, the deni there's a lot of deniers in Britain. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of contrarians. Not that that's something to be proud of, I'm just saying. <laughs> And, and uh, go ahead. There are certainly a lot of politicians who don't necessarily have the dedication to doing something about it. Like, it's one thing for a person to deny climate change. That bothers me on a fundamental level because I care about objective reality and truth. But if you believe that it's happening and you won't do what's necessary to stop it, that almost bothers me more. Yeah. That's almost more of a dereliction of the duty you have to your species and to your planet. Yeah. But politics makes strange bedfellows, to be sure. But at some point, somebody's going to have to step up and just go, let's go, people. Let's address this. So with that said, just doing a shooting from the hip calculation, there's enough wind, solar, global, uh, wind, solar, uh, tidal energy and geothermal energy to run the whole place if you just decided to do it, yeah. if we just got to work, just change things. And this is something you want to do over the next 30 years, you know, not just one weekend. And then when people say, I'm overwhelmed, I can't possibly address this, my life is miserable, I think about <laughs> World War II. My parents were both veterans of World War II. When Pearl Harbor was bombed, it was like the world ended. It was like things are over. But everybody got together, and in five years, they turned the whole thing around. So we can do this, people. Let's go. Let's get her done. <laughs> It's a rallying cry if I ever heard one. Let me ask you this. 
have the goalposts moved because of the politics and how things have changed over the past couple of years? When our EPA is rolling things back oh. and, and all these sort of things, has your approach to this fight had to change and evolve as well? Well, I've definitely focused, I mean, before the election, I, I one of the main threats that I stressed that could come about as a result of what might happen in that election was a rolling back of, of some of Obama's efforts in climate change, the higher fuel efficiency standards, the methane regulations, things like polluting streams and rivers, you know, despoiling Bears Ears and you know Grand Staircase Escalante, all of that. I, I don't personally believe that what was being done under the past administration was to the task of dealing with climate change, but moving in the opposite direction seems like an even worse idea. And so I am doing whatever I can to continually stress how we need to be racing forward and instead we're being held back now. The, the, this was a difficult challenge 10 years ago. Every year it's a more difficult challenge. I believe that we can actually match it, but it becomes harder and harder. And while I love challenge mode in video games, I don't necessarily want it for dealing with climate change. I feel like scientists have been kind of realizing like we can't just talk to each other. We need to talk to other people. We need to tell this story. And we're terrible at it. And I'm sorry, bear with us. I don't even know how to use the microphone. Um, <laughs> but like we are trying. Um, and I think there's a growing realization that it's not about the science. You know, if somebody says something and you're like, that is factually incorrect, and you provide them facts, that almost never changes somebody's mind. Yeah. And we do the opposite. Yeah, totally. And so we've been waking up fact, to that, in yeah. Psychology. Yeah, and so uh, my experience in this world of skepticism, this is to say uh, there are no haunted houses, astrology is nothing. Uh, you can't talk to your dead ancestors uh, as though it's a phone line with a bad connection. It takes people about two years when confronted with the overwhelming evidence that astrology is bunk. It, they have to hear it many times. They have to think about it. They have to literally sleep on it. And so this, we're talking about grown-ups. You know, kids can understand it right away because they, they just don't have this life experience that would, where the self-confirming uh, uh, correlation is not, con is not uh, causation and so on. So do we got to be patient, or not patient, we have to stick with it, I mean. It takes about two years for a grown-up to change his or her mind, in my experience. I think one of the challenges that we face in terms of communicating about this issue is that we are... We're coming at it decades after the attack from the other side. Like there has been a news network for decades telling people that the professors are lying to your kids, yeah. the scientists are lying about the science. Uh, none of this is actually true. And when climate change is talked about, it is talked about purely, or dealing with climate change, it's talked about purely in terms of the cost in dealing with it. What is it gonna take in terms of jobs and you know harming economic growth? And I think that one of the things we need to do is not simply focus on convincing people that the, the science is true, which I think is important, but also stressing that this is not just a challenge, challenge we face, but a series of opportunities. We're dealing with pollution will have effects now. You know, doing something about solar energy, wind energy provides jobs now. Coming up with cars, like I drove an electric car for years. I didn't do that purely because it's better for the environment. In some cases it might not be, but they're better cars in a lot of ways. There are so many opportunities that we need to respond to this message that dealing with climate change is only going to hurt you. That is not the case. So furthermore, also in addition to continue, uh, understand that if you build wind turbines here in, in the Midwest or in the East Coast, uh, you will have jobs here. These are not jobs that can be exported. And you will not n need nearly as many military people on the other side of the world protecting your energy reserves. You will not need to have a standing army in the Middle East to keep the oil flowing. Though I, it's just going to take a long time for people to get it. After you drive an electric car, I know we're in New York, and I hope very few of you own cars because it's such a pain. But just in practice. But yeah. after you drive an electric car, you will never go back. When will you go back, Matt? Never. That's exactly right. <laughs> you will never go back. And the thing to understand, just fundamentally, about electric cars. Well, what if we run out of lithium? Okay, let's just back up a second. <laughs> Pun intended. Is that the car does not know where the electrons came from? Mm -hmm. The car can't tell if you made them in a coal-fired plant, a nuclear plant, or wind and, and solar, or geothermal and tidal energy. The car is, is an important puzzle piece. So three things we want for everybody in the world, clean water, 
renewably produced reliable electricity and access to whatever the internet comes to be called, global electronic, global electronic information. Global-ish. And so uh, we want to electrify all ground transportation. And if you're out there, chemical engineering students, entrepreneurs, people who protect intellectual property, some attorneys, we want a new fuel for air transportation. Liquefied hydrogen, liquefied methane made from carbon dioxide in the air, something like that. This would be uh, a fantastic thing. First of all, you would uh, save the planet for us. And the other thing, it's very reasonable. If you played your cards properly, you would get rich. <laughs> Isn't that good? And so, um, you know, as we say, the planet's going to be here no matter what humans do. We want to save the planet for me, <laughs> for us humans. This is, I, this is where I, if it's, if it's the Earth versus Mars, in the solar system cup, I'm all about Earth. I mean, I, 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 this is where I grew up. It's my home planet. Everybody I know is from here. All the stuff's here. Yes, yeah. that. I get it. Yeah. I get it. I, I, I really got to, I want to throw it over to the audience in the spirit of doing stuff for us. Uh, I'm going to do that, but it's Dr. Marvel. looked like you were about to say something or no, you just, no? No, I was, I was just looking very interested. Very, yeah. <laughs> no. That you were. You sold it. All right, uh, before <laughs> I throw it over to the audience, uh, just a quick reminder, guys. Bill Nye, Science Guy, airs on PBS. That's tonight, Wednesday, April 18th. Uh, True North on Verizon's Go90. That's tomorrow, 419. And you can catch Dr. Kate Marvel's TED Talk, Can Clouds Buy Us More Time to Solve Climate Change? Over one million times been viewed. Can't be wrong. So go ahead and watch it if you haven't already. Uh, you, yeah, you can applaud. It's your turn to ask questions. <laughs> <laughs> Ben and I got mics out there. We've got some mics. All right, so the first questions appear to be coming from you guys. Let's go for it. See if it works. Go for uh, it. You said that 10 years old was the oldest that you could get that lifelong passion for science. What was it that incited that passion in, in yourself? Uh, I often say I don't remember. It was so long ago. But this is a story I've told many times. I was stung by a bee. I think we were playing Crazy Eights, you know that card game? In the summer on the front porch. And this was traumatic. If you've been stung by a bee and you're three and a half, it's, it's very troubling. And so uh, I'm crying and this and that, and my mother put ammonia on it. I don't know if you've seen a bottle of ammonia, but Windex, the active thing in Windex is ammonia. And so hardcore housekeepers keep pure, or not pure, a, a bottle of ammonia solution around, and it has a skull and crossbones. <laughs> like my mother's trying to kill me, which, I can understand, you know, <laughs> uh, but it, uh, the ammonia denatures the protein and the bee sting, and so it felt better. Like, wh whoa, this is like magic, but it's not magic, it's... Science! Yes! <laughs> so I got hooked. That was amazing. That, by the way, remember I said at the beginning of the show, this audience is crushing it? Thank you for proving that you guys are... That was an amazing question. Thank you. We've got another one coming at you from... Oh, right next. Oh, go for it, buddy. Um, you said that we need, to sh um, we need to spread the news that, you know, pollution is, hor is a horrible thing. And some people also try sputtering it. Not only you, I tried telling this to my parents, but why do people still drive cars and not switch to bicycles or electric cars? Why, why do you think this happens, and how could we switch this? Well, in civil engineering, they call it the level of service. So you can leave your house, get in your car, listen to your music, send your text messages by voice, and arrive at your place of business. The next thing you're going to do all as if by magic. You know, uh, people play soccer games. They aspire to get on the traveling team. Well, if you're on the traveling team and as, as a soccer player, you got to get in a car. There's very few places where you don't have to get in a car. And cars provide this fantastic level of service. But at some level, I guess that's uh, overuse of that word, at some point, it's, in, it's so inefficient. And you can tell it's inefficient, just try pushing a car. <laughs> it's really difficult. And speaking of bicycles, if I were king of the footiest, uh, bicycle is, I'm a mechanical engineer, bicycle is the most efficient machine known. A human on a bicycle is nothing, a bowl of oatmeal, 30 miles, boom. 
It's like uh, it's an amazing conversion of, of fuel to transportation. So what we want to do is continue to enable bicycles. And so there was a time, if you're of my age, where everybody you meet uh, wanted to live in the country. This was like a dream, have a house in the country. But people are realizing that that crazy inefficiency is actually kind of a drag. And this is, as a New Yorker, you might know, it's cool. You go outside, you can buy a, a carton of almond milk or whatever politically correct <laughs> beverage you want uh, at any time. The almonds use too much water, Bill. How can you support it? Okay, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. So, uh, uh, the, and strangely enough, as dense as New York is, and there's people everywhere, and there's hilarious jokes are made about New Yorkers, New Yorkers are actually, from a carbon footprint standpoint, quite efficient compared to, for example, the classic is Oklahoma City, where this, it's just spread out, spread out, spread out in oil country, and people find they have to drive all day to just get their lives led. And so things are changing. You are living at a cool time. And uh, you, how old are you? Do you remember? Twelve. Yeah. I was twelve. Uh, for a while. <laughs> no, that's I was. And then I was. Uh, then I was thir That's right. Then I changed to thirteen. But if you want to influence this guy's parents, get him excited about climate change. You will just hassle your parents till their heads explode. Way to go. You will. You have control, man. It's really good. Go get them. You're going to be in charge pretty soon. Thank you. No pressure. Thank you for that question. Yeah, absolutely applaud. We've got a few more. We're going to take our next one. Uh, I see you pointing, Bennett. I don't know where it is. Oh, right here. Here we are. Hi. Um, I'm an environmental studies student at NYU right now, um, and I'm finding it very difficult sometimes to uh, not get like cynical, especially in regards to like our current administration and the lack of progress going towards climate change issues. So my question for you guys is how you all stay positive while still studying climate change. Well, if you're not optimistic, you're gonna, not going to get anything done. Uh, sorry, that's just how it is. I mean, you're not going to, if you don't think you can do it, you really won't. And the model for this that we all revere is sports. You know, these, you can hate sports and be cynical about sports, but we have whole networks dedicated to people who spend their whole lives trying to be really good at something. And if you go into any sort of competition thinking you're not going to win, you won't. I mean, so, and by the way, what are you going to do instead? Throw in the towel? Just light every, turn on every light in your house and leave the car <laughs> engine running all night? You know, what, the, what are you going to do? So let's go, people. And what I say all the time is just get started. If you do one thing to address climate change, you'll feel good about it and you'll start doing another thing and the thing after that. Let's go. I have found in covering news before the election, since the election, it can feel very, it can make you feel sort of alone when you constantly see these powerful people who represent every value that you don't hold. They're the inverse of you. And if you go on social media, social media is very good at making you believe that everyone around you is insane. And that can make you feel alone. So what I have done, and it's helpful that I'm in a big city, but you don't have to be in a big city, is I have gone to every march that I can, every demonstration that I can, and I've surrounded myself by extremely passionate people who are not throwing in the towel. And so sometimes I go like a, like a political vampire, and I suck up their positive feelings, and that recharges me to, to continue. So go ahead. Oh, um, I just say, you, know, you said you're an environmental scientist. Great. Um, so as a scientist, something that really comforts me is, is just thinking, this planet is so amazing. You know, I feel like a lot of times we, we lose that sense of wonder and all the doom and gloom. But like, this planet is wonderful and we can comprehend it. And like, that's so crazy and so wonderful and so beautiful. And I find it really comforting. Uh, wow. <laughs> no, but in the theater, we talk about this all the time. You're nervous before you go on the stage. You gotta take that nervousness and make it into excitement. So you gotta take that worry, that anxiety, and turn it into action. And it's easy to say, and there's guys who make a whole living on motivational speaking and all that doing this stuff, but it's a real thing. If you can, if you just get started, you're we're gonna make changes, I'm telling. And you're, you're, the other thing I tell everybody is you gotta vote. 
you just got to vote. And I think the last election reminded us of that big time. Uh, you know, I, you can, I know people watch whatever. They can hate me. They can hate everything. I'm miserable, too. I'm right there. <laughs> but if Al Gore had become president when you were in college or about to go to college, Slightly before, yeah. the world would be different. There will be people who say it would be worse, he's an idiot, he's a poser, whatever you want to say. But the world would be different because he would have done something about climate change almost 20 years ago. And, you know, BT dubs, he did win the popular vote <laughs> as the last election, same problem. So everybody, we got to vote. And now uh, we are living through the second Cold War. And this is a, a subtle problem based on ideology. But built into the U.S., built into what people shorthand call liberal democracies, Denmark or whatever, is change. Change is built in, and that's the key. You've got to change to adapt. So as the climate changes, we're going to have to adapt. Let's go. Let's go. We've got time for one more question. It appears to be right here in the front. I'm an incoming biology and society major at Cornell University. <sighs> big and red, go big go red, red, go bears. <laughs> and I was wondering what all three of you would, what advice you would give to people who are incoming into the STEM field? Science, technology, engineering, and math education. Uh, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Just mathematics. Yeah. Is show your passion. Show your passion. Be passionate. Uh, when you're in love, you want to tell the world. So if you love math the way any civilized person does, <laughs> then uh, let, them, you know, let them hear you outside. Blow the roof off the dump. Because uh, what did you like about your favorite teacher or favorite professor or whoever, or, or, or um, Dr. Marvel, is her passion, right? Yeah, I would definitely say that. It was the passion. You know, like when teachers were passionate about what they taught me, I definitely felt more engaged in the subject. So that's, since you asked, that's what I'd say. Yeah. <laughs> um, I would say the flip side of that is um, don't, don't be afraid of failure. Um, so many times we have this narrative that, oh, scientists are geniuses and they're perfect and they never make mistakes. And I have never met a genius scientist and I've met a lot of scientists. Um, you know, I feel like science is built on getting stuff wrong. Um, you make mistakes, you get stuff wrong, you believe things, and then the thing you believe turned out to be completely insane, and so you don't believe that anymore. And, and that's how we move forward, and I think that's one of the most beautiful things about science. So, like, you are gonna screw up, and everybody screws up, and not only is that okay, but that's sort of the most important part of the whole process. So, ha have fun making mistakes. I would say, I have to admit, I'm actually not from the STEM field. I'm from, my graduate work was in political psychology. But uh, when I got interested in politics, it was, we, we talked about, like, these people who are passionate. Like, find a mentor. Find someone who, who can motivate you and help bring you through the field. But also, like, as you're... As you're going into any field, you get the sort of top-level view of what it's about, and that can interest you. And then as you learn more, you realize that these fields are absolutely massive, any one of them. Like, I have a friend who was an engineer who worked uh, you know, on AIDS prevention in Africa, and I have another friend who builds drones in California. Like, these are such huge fields. But even that is just step two. Step three is creating your own area. And uh, the people who built drones, at one point, there were no drones. Someone had to invent them. Maybe someone will invent the, uh, the methane fuel for planes in the future. And that could be you. Like, these books are a starting off point, but someday people will be writing about your research and what you created. That was awesome. Well done. Uh, thank you, everyone, for your amazing questions and for being a wonderful audience. We are out of time, so we're going to wrap it up. I will remind everybody one final time tonight on PBS, Bill Nye, Science Guy. Tomorrow, Verizon Go 90. True North is there. And if you have internet, then you have the ability to watch one of the most watched TED Talks over a million times. Go check it out. Uh, everybody make some noise, a ridiculous amount of noise. Thanks, John Adderall, Dr. Marvel, Mr. Bill Nye. <laughs>